Hello, and a very warm welcome to everyone joining us today for the launch of HIRE, a hiring initiative to reimagine equity. As chair of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, I'm delighted to kick off this important initiative with my esteemed colleagues from OFCCP, uh, the director, Ginny Yang, vice chair of the EEOC, Jocelyn Samuels, and our distinguished guest. Today we observed, or, or Monday rather, we observed Dr. Martin Luther King's National Day of Service. Dr. King's work had a direct connection to the EEOC because our agency has, was created in response to the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom to help provide equal opportunity to good quality jobs. Central to Dr. King's work and his legacy was the goal of pushing America to live up to its ideals of a society that is broadly inclusive and offers opportunities for everyone. We are still working to fully realize those ideals. Today, as we launch higher and build on Dr. King's rich legacy, we also build on the growing momentum across this country to create the inclusive, fair society for which Dr. King advocated. This joint initiative of the EEOC and OFCCP seeks to advance equal employment opportunity in recruitment and hiring by expanding equal opportunities to good jobs for all workers. This initiative could not be more timely. Since the summer of 2020, diverse coalitions have called and worked and marched for racial justice for communities of color. The COVID-19 pandemic has exposed deeply ingrained inequities and has proved to be not only a public health and economic crisis, but also a civil rights crisis. The pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on women and workers who are Black, Latino, Asian, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and Native American, as well as immigrants, people with disabilities, and others. At the same time, many employers are seeking to increase diversity in their workforces and have an urgent business need to attract a broad array of talent. Drawing on the experience of EOC and OFCCP in addressing systemic barriers to employment, HIRE will identify actionable strategies that work by bringing together leading employer, worker, and research efforts to create more equitable hiring practices. Today's roundtable is the first of several conversations to help reimagine recruitment and hiring. While today's discussion will focus on issues of race and national origin, I want to make clear that this initiative defines diversity broadly to include other bases such as age, disability, color, veteran status, religion, and sex, including pregnancy, sexual orientation, and gender identity. To effectively develop innovative recruiting and hiring practices, we need to hear from experts and from leaders, including employers, federal contractors, worker and civil rights organizations, social scientists, and others. So I very much look forward to today's discussion and I turn, the, turn it over now for opening remarks from OFCCP Director Jennifer Yang. Thank you so much, Chair Burroughs. I am thrilled to be here with you. Over 3,000 people registered to join us today. And it's energizing to imagine what is possible when we come together to advance equal opportunity in hiring. Dr. King's lifelong work inspired profound progress Two years after the March on Washington, President Johnson signed Executive Order 11246, which prompted the creation of OFCCP to lead equal opportunity enforcement for federal contractors. Our nation's commitment to racial equity in federal contracting dates back over 80 years to President Roosevelt's adoption of Executive Order 8802 to prohibit defense contractors from discrimination. Civil rights leader and labor organizer A. Philip Randolph played an instrumental role in creating momentum for this early action. To build on the legacy of these civil rights giants, OFCCP works with the federal contracting community and worker organizations to make equal opportunity a reality. Yet, 
Research has documented the striking persistence of racial discrimination in our labor markets and the stalled progress over the past several decades. As our country makes major investments in our infrastructure and we rebuild from the pandemic, we don't want to just build back the economy we had before. We have a once in a generation opportunity to rebuild better. To achieve our nation's ideals of opportunity and equality, we must answer Dr. King's call for vigorous and positive action. OSCCP and EEOC have launched higher to redouble our efforts and engage employers, workers, and researchers in identifying concrete solutions during this critical juncture. CEOs have identified recruiting and retaining talent as their top priority. And more than three quarters of employers agree they need to reassess how they hire. Yet despite the strong demand for workers, in some communities, people are struggling to be hired. As we anticipate the future of work, we know more workers will need to change occupations in the years ahead, and we wanna make sure those are good jobs. Understanding what matters most to workers, as well as the challenges facing employers is essential to developing workable solutions. Through hire, we will identify proactive strategies to support better and more equitable hiring practices. We use the term reimagine equity to foster dialogue about how we can reassess hiring practices that might initially seem fair, but upon further examination, actually exclude qualified workers for the wrong reasons. Systems may rely on outmoded hiring criteria that are not truly job related, such as unnecessary degree or experience requirements. In addition, hiring processes may enable bias to operate through subjective resume reviews or evaluations of fit. Tech-based hiring systems, including using artificial intelligence, may seem neutral, but may actually perpetuate inequality in the algorithms they use to screen workers. Today, we have an incredible group of leaders with us to explore how we can reimagine hiring systems to advance racial equity. We look forward to building on their ideas in our work ahead. And now I will turn it over to EEOC Vice Chair Jocelyn Samuels to introduce our esteemed speakers today. Jocelyn. Well, thank you so much, Director Yang, and to you and Chair Burroughs. Those were inspiring remarks. I'm so delighted to be part of this higher initiative, which I know will help to fulfill the promise of equal opportunity for all people in the workplace. It's a privilege to introduce today's roundtable participants who have all been leaders in efforts to expand diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and to reverse discrimination that has blocked too many workers from economic prosperity for too long. I'll start with Cindy Benavides, who is the CEO of the League of United Latin American Citizens, or LULA the country's oldest Hispanic civil rights organization. Cindy provides leadership for the more than 1,000 LULAC councils, excuse me, nationwide, that advance economic rights and opportunities for Hispanic Americans through community-based programs. Welcome, Cindy. Next is Lola Smallwood Cuevas, the founder of the Los Angeles Black Workers Center, a project of the UCLA Labor Center focused on solving the black job crisis in California. BWC aims to build power among black workers to increase access to quality jobs, address employment discrimination and transform industries that employ black workers. Thank you for joining us, Lola. Dr. Kathleen Lundquist is president and CEO of APT Metrics, which is a nationally recognized human resource consultancy firm focused on talent solutions and employment litigation support services. Kathleen's work has been published in dozens of journals and textbooks dedicated to the field of psychometrics. Thank you so much for being with us. 
Fred Redmond is the secretary treasurer of the AFL-CIO, a democratic voluntary federation of 57 national and international labor unions representing 12.5 million workers. Fred is the first black secretary treasurer in the AFL-CIO's history. He has been an active union member since 1973 and served in a variety of roles dedicated to advancing racial justice in the workplace. Welcome, Fred. Vita Richardson is the president and CEO of the Association of Corporation Council, the world's largest legal association dedicated to serving the interests of in-house counsel. Their members include 98% of the Fortune 100 and 51% of the global 1,000 companies. Welcome, Vita. And finally, last but not least, Sid Wilson is the president and CEO of the Hispanic Association on Corporate Responsibility, ASER. ASER is an organization dedicated to advancing inclusion and representation for Hispanic people at all levels of corporate America. Sid launched his career in 1993, was steadily promoted from the mailroom to the executive suite and previously served as the national president of the Dominican American National Roundtable. Thank you for joining us, Sid. I look forward to what you and all of our esteemed participants have to share with that. And with that, I'll turn it back to Chair Burroughs and Director Yang to moderate this exciting roundtable. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Samuels. And to kick us off, uh, we'd like to start by exploring how hiring barriers keep workers from accessing good jobs and why this is so important at this moment for us to look at that problem and build on Dr. King's legacy with respect to advancing racial equity in hiring practices. So I'd like to start first um, and have the honor of joining all of you and thank you for doing that. I wanted to start actually with Fred and talk about the union work at the AFL-CIO and your view on how unions and workers are seeing the challenges and the opportunities for change at this moment. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank you, Chair Burroughs and Director Yang, for including me and in the voice of the AFL-CIO in this most important discussion. Uh, look, the labor movement has a long history of removing the barriers that present that prevent workers from assessing good family supporting jobs. And the labor movement's ties to the civil rights movement, it run deep because of Dr. King. I mean, Dr. King spoke at the AFL-CIO convention in 1961. He walked the picket line in 1964 in Atlanta when 700 black working women went on strike. And we all know that Dr. King was in Memphis in 1968 to stand in solidarity with striking sanitation workers at the time that he was assassinated. And we have to ask ourselves, why was Dr. King and the civil rights movement allied with the labor movement? Because Dr. King understood that in this country, racial oppression cannot be separated from economic exploitation. That social and racial equality depends on economic security. It was true then, and it remains true today. <clears throat> you see, civil rights and, the, and labor rights, they are intertwined. I mean, we could just take a look at the EEOC, for example. It is the only government agency that was created from the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And what some folks don't realize is that the AFL-CIO insisted on the Fair Employment Practices section of the Civil Rights Act. The early drafts omitted it, and at several turns, lawmakers tried to cut it. But the AFL-CIO would not let them cut it out of the act. And its passage established a clear basis for invoking the power of the federal government into eliminating job discrimination. Labor rights in a civil rights bill, because labor rights are civil rights, and working people are coming to that realization again today. You see, the pandemic has pulled back the curtain 
It is rebelling the cracks. It's, it's putting the inequities and injustices of our system on full display, where black and brown Americans are disproportionately harmed, where low wage workers are called essential, but treated as expendable. You know, we've heard a lot about the great resignation, the worker shortage, but what we have in this country is a shortage of good jobs. And workers today are rejecting jobs where they risk their health and lives for poverty wages that don't lift them out of poverty. And unions have a long history of turning bad jobs into good life-changing careers. And that's what we're doing now. We have the opportunity to make sure that we don't just recover from the pandemic, but that the recovery that that but that the recovery is equitable. And that starts with equitable hiring practice, equitable access to jobs and apprenticeship opportunity. It's not just an opportunity, it's a necessity for the overall health of our economy and overall health of our democracy. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that. And I, Cindy and Lola, what barriers do you see for the communities that you work with in with respect to accessing good jobs? And what new opportunities might there be to address that issue? First and foremost, uh, thank you so much, Chair Burroughs, Director Yang, and Vice Chair Samuels for having this timely discussion. You know, as, as LULAC, as a Latino civil rights organization, you know, first we look at the data and we know that today, 18% of the US population is Latino. And in just 30 years and three decades, one in three Americans will be of Latino ancestry. And so as we're looking at hiring practices, as we're looking at those changes today, we know that the actions that are made today will impact the economic future of our country. The fact is diversity is good for America. Diversity is good for the world. And as Dr. Martin Luther King would say, whatever affects one directly affects all of us indirectly. As we look at civil rights, a civil rights issue that impacts one community impacts all communities. As I think of the Latino community and particularly during the pand pandemic, we already knew that there were systemic barriers, not only to hiring, but in so many other practices within labor. And during the pandemic, what we found in the Latino community was that five out of six Latinos, according to our Surgeon General, had to leave their houses every single day to work and get paid. We are the essential workers of America, but lack the protections in the workplace. And I just want us to think about our farm workers, our meat packing workers, our health industry workers, who every day put their lives on the line to make sure that America keeps running. I would say that as we think of the challenges that exist, absolutely one of the main ones is around infrastructure and access to broadband. Today, one in three Latinos do not have access to broadband or technology. One in three. If you can just imagine all of our children who were not able to do online learning because they were not equipped with the right tools and they had didn't have the right infrastructure. If you can imagine Latino workers and all other workers who may not have access to broadband at home and may not be computer literate to even submit an employment application online to get to be able to be employed. I would say also, as we look at the Latino community, a segment of the Latino community is immigrant. And we know that, you know, there are so many communities that have immigrant communities. But the fact is that today in America, there is a negative narrative about immigrants, about Latinos, and about so many in our communities of color. And so it's making sure that we shift that narrative for the good of America and understand truly what history, what our history is here in our country. I would say as we look at issues that impact Latinos, the issue of language, 13% of the population in the US speak Spanish at home. And so understanding that there are states where there may be an over index and making sure that we're meeting our workers where they are is critically important.
I would also say as we're thinking of the future of work, as we're thinking of how do we continue to make sure that we have a workforce that meets the demands of today, that we're thinking ahead, not just what's next. I'm going to stop there because I know so many others have so much more to add, but I wanted to again reiterate that for us, whatever affects one of us directly affects all of us directly. And so as we look at these issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, hiring, that all of these impacts all of us together. Thank you so much. And I could not agree more with the sentiment that we're all interconnected and that we have to think forward. And that is so much at the heart of what this is about. So I wanted to hear from Lola about that if you wanted to add in terms of what you're seeing and for, with respect to barriers and potential solutions uh, for the communities you work with. Sure, thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this important uh, initiative. Uh, we look forward to working with you, um, both the National Black Worker Center and regional Black Worker Centers in Southern California, who every day our members are fighting for jobs and justice um, to ensure that the 1.5 million Black working families have, have an opportunity to support and sustain themselves and their families. I wanted to start with a statistic to illustrate the explosive levels of economic violence that Black workers now face in our region. In California, from March of 2020 to 2021, 83% of Black people in the state filed for some form of unemployment benefits and assistance. We can fully delve into the deeply rooted and historic complex crisis of, of Black employment today, but I did want to share some of the few barriers I believe we have the opportunity to address, namely the scarcity of quality jobs, with, with which Fred alluded to earlier, the lack of access and retention of Black workers where good jobs exist, and institutional racism and workplace bias that continue, um, as, as, you, as you mentioned, Commissioner Barrows, to be um, a, a challenge uh, in our American workplaces. Um, you know, I don't, I, I, Fred spoke to this, but I did want to say that when we talk about hiring and how do we ensure we attract and retain and sustain Black workers in employment, we have to focus on organizing and creating and transforming bad jobs into good jobs. What we see uh, is that in our community that Black workers are having to work two and three, uh, maybe two jobs and a gig uh, hustle side informal job to really make ends meet. And they're choosing, right, because these jobs don't, don't provide um, a, a fair living, they're choosing between rent and PPE and even COVID tests right, in order to, to be safe in this environment. And as Fred says, they're rejecting these jobs. And we have the opportunity to stand with workers to make these, uh, um, these employment opportunities a place where workers have fair benefits, have wages, and have voice to really shape the type of working conditions that we need in this moment. I think another barrier that we're, we're seeing is that where we have strong middle-class sectors, there is a severe underrepresentation of Black workers, right? We see social network hiring building exclusive fences, right, around whole sectors and an absence of relevant pathways that lead to quality job placement. The growing relevance on automated hiring processes also that don't factor in the deep digital Black the Black digital divide and replicate disparate outcomes. Um, I think a great opportunity that we need to double down on is this idea of high road training partnerships and policies. These are intentional investments in building equitable pathways for workers. For example, in the Inland Empire, a project called IE Works is bringing Black worker centers and water utilities together with state resources, right, to create earn and learn opportunities, right, that are about training workers, but also placing them in quality career pathways. They're using tailored wraparound services, right, industry and peer networks for workers to be able to feel belonging in the sectors and to feel supported. 
And we know that, you know, we see CEOs and, and other managers who have coaching and support. Certainly, we believe that underrepresented, vulnerable Black workers deserve the same opportunity and support for success. And the last barrier I want to lift up, obviously, is racism. And in, in our communities, we know this history. We have seen the, the racial reckoning that has taken place these next two, last two years. And our workplaces do have and have to address this workplace toxin that overtakes hiring, work assignments, promotions. We have workers fired just for wearing a Black, worker, a Black Lives Matter t-shirt to their warehouse job, right? So we need to think about ways in which agencies like the, the OFCCP and the DOL and the EEOC come together and really modernize and update anti-discrimination policies, particularly Executive Order 11246. How do we set standards that disaggregate goals, right, that specifically call in Black workers and underrepresented groups to ensure contractors understand the complex diversity of a 21st century economy and to build equitable pathways? We also see many um, growing partnerships um, in our region between local offices and state enforcement agencies working with employers, right, to, to create more boots on the ground, to educate workers, to educate supervisors, and to better protect workers. Federal agencies have an opportunity to double down on these types of partnerships, to strengthen them, to join them. And we think that by addressing just some of these issues, right, that are complicated, but if we come together around these things, bringing community, unions, workers and employers to the table that we can make a difference. Absolutely. Well, I want to make sure, since you mentioned also bringing employers and other voices in the table, I'd love to, to turn to Vita and to Sid about the challenges that employers are facing in, in advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility efforts. And what makes this moment, from your perspectives, different? Oh, excuse me, we seem to have a technical issue. Vita, if you could begin again. Oh, please excuse me for being on mute. Um, good afternoon, Chair Barrows, Director Yang, Vice Chair Samuels, and guests. As I respond to the question about um, inclusion, diversity, equity, ac ac accessibility, and I prefer to call it IDEA, and share what I think makes this moment different, let me offer you first a view from ACC's lens. Um, we know how central the issues of IDEA are to the corporate community. When ACC surveyed our membership, our chief legal officers, 73% reported that diversity and inclusion issues were a priority that would continue to accelerate in importance. And by 2022, our new survey that won't be released until January 25th reinforces that CLOs expect increased attention to diversity and inclusion. And our data put, paints a very strong picture of companies who are increasingly turning to CLOs to both lead ESG efforts and to oversee HR functions. Um, we found that 24% of CLOs now have oversight for ESG. That's up 15% from last year. 40% report that ESG issues are forcing their companies to really focus on strengthening and improving compliance efforts, CLOs are again playing a role. And 20% of CLOs now oversee HR, that's up 16% from 16% from last year. So what I see is that such sizable gains over just one year success, uh, suggest that societal challenges that we're facing regarding racial, gender, cultural, socioeconomic have created a powder keg. Um, especially as companies have issued statements regarding BLM, George Floyd, anti-Asian hate crimes, and more. And we're also seeing that customers and investors are increasingly vocal about expecting results beyond statements. And during the most recent proxy season, ESG and IDEA were hot topics on shareholders' minds. So we believe by giving CLOs greater responsibility than ever, over HR, ESG, and compliance in, in addition to the traditional legal role, employers are signaling that legal and compliance risk 
does pose challenges to them in advancing IDEA. Um, a reality is that an employer's effort to support or boost one group, regardless of how disadvantaged or underrepresented, runs the risk in today's society of triggering all kinds of claims of reverse discrimination, exclusion, and being passed over by another group. That's certainly no excuse for not following through to seek to advance ideas. And when CLOs were asked about organizational priorities over the next five years, they told us that investing in employees was a top priority. In fact, that choice saw a nine percentage point increase over the past two years and rated almost as important and as high as maximizing profits. So I believe that this effort that we're undertaking to reimagine um, how we advance IDEA is well-timed and that in-house counsel have important roles uh, to play. And it's for that reason, ACC is excited to be at the table to contribute. Thank you. Well, we are so excited to have your participation and um, look forward to hearing more about your experience as, as our conversation goes forward. And uh, turning to Sid, uh, talk to me about what, from your vantage point at HESER, uh, you employers are seeing and what you think makes this uh, moment different. Well, sure. Well, well first of all, uh, thank you, Chair Burroughs and Vice Chair Samuels and Director Yang for the opportunity for us to uh, uh, be here with, with all of you. And, and I just say, when I started this to everyone, unless you're on the West Coast, one of the, um, but here are some of the key things that that we're seeing uh, from the standpoint of uh, the, the challenges, the challenges of the lack of inclusion, what corporate America is doing, what some of the things that they're doing right in some of the areas where there are significant uh, issues. One is that it's there's no question that uh, that corporate America, um, every company you talk to say they are committed to diversity and inclusion. That's the thing that you hear throughout corporate America. But what's different is that just being supportive of diversity, equity, and inclusion is not enough. There is a difference between supporting it and championing it. And, um, and while there are some that have taken it to the level of championing diversity and inclusion by being an ally to the movement, um, we know that that is still not enough in terms of seeing uh, systemic change in, uh, in, in what we're seeing. So for example, is that we know that uh, when you look at the early career positions up to mid-level managers, you tend to see more diversity uh, and inclusion uh, among the employees there. And you'll see that uh, particularly in the B2C businesses. But when you go from mid-level manager up to senior director, VPs and C-suite and board directors, it falls off a cliff. And, and to this day, Hacer uh, did a study with, the, with our Alliance for Board Diversity Partners. And when you look at the fact that even in this day and age, you're seeing 4% Latinos on boards, uh, about 9% of African-Americans on boards. And, uh, and while we're seeing movement on women, but it's still at, at, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the early low 20s, which is still not where it should be. And you look at the C-suites and you see the pipeline where it's all aligning. You see almost similar numbers there. There is still to this day, this is 2022, there are still six Fortune 500 companies that have all white male corporate board directors to this day. No women, no people of color. And, uh, and when you ask the question of why is it, um, there is this guardianship of culture, even if it's at the expense of, uh, of doing the right thing for diversity. So you hear companies saying that we can't find the qualified uh, people of color or women, for which we say, well, what do you define as qualified? If it's a very white male centric perspective of that, that may not be the definition of qualified. Um, when we hear comments uh, such, such as, we want the business case for diversity and inclusion. I often counter say, show me the business case for an all white male board and all white male C-suite, and then I'll show you the business case for diversity and inclusion. In other words, they're asking people of color and women to be held to a different standard that they are not doing 
for those if you're a white male. They don't ask white males about your qualifications. It's about sponsorship. They don't ask about the business case. They, it's all about connections. And so that is where together with the EOC and all of our partners that we can say it's time for change, but it requires championship change uh, to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion from the board of directors to the C-suite, down to the mid-level and into the front line to create a culture that is about acculturation, not assimilation into an, into an old uh, uh, paradigm of what corporate America looks like. So last, I'd like to turn to Kathleen and ask, you know, what are the common barriers to hiring that you're, you've seen in advising employers and what's changing about how employers hire? Thank you, Chair Burroughs. Um, in our work with employers, we're seeing that even though they've had these goals for diversity uh, for, for so many years, they're just not meeting those goals. And the, the, the developments of the past couple of years have really focused employers into thinking, what are we doing right? What are we doing wrong? And some of those barriers that, that they're identifying relate to the use of inconsistent or undefined hiring practices. So for example, many employers use interviews to hire or determine who finally gets the job from among people who've applied. But most of those interviews in many organizations are not structured, are not oriented to uh, what the job requirements are, um, and, and that makes them very prone to bias. So that certainly is one area. We particularly think this area is important since we've seen a number of organizations who used to use tests no longer using tests. Now, tests among some people have the perception of being biased, and not all tests are equal, right? Some are well uh, suited to predicting who will be good on the job, but others are not. Um, and as Sid was talking about the more senior levels of organizations, what we've seen there is again, this absence of a profile of what, this, what the competencies are that are really required to be successful in senior leadership in organizations today. Um, that really requires us to perhaps rethink what are the challenges the organization is going to be facing. And frankly, it gives us an opportunity now more than we've ever had before. And I believe these were the remarks uh, of both you, Chair Burroughs and, and uh, Director Yang, that diversity can be the solution to some of the problems that organizations are, are seeing. That We are uniquely positioned to be able to uh, grab the uh, enthusiasm and willingness of those in corporate America to change the way things are done and to start using more evidence-based ways of making hiring decisions. Well, that is a perfect segue to the solutions part of our conversation. And for that, I will turn it over to uh, Director Ginny Yang. Thanks so much, Chair Burroughs, and I thank all of you for sharing these candid and important insights about some of the challenges that you see. What I'd like to give you a chance to do now is to highlight some of the solutions that you're most excited about. Um, you know, how are employers reimagining hiring practices to attract historically underrepresented workers? And I'll start with Sid to dig into that a little bit further. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll say briefly, one is that um, you can't put all of this on your chief diversity officer to be the solution for all things diversity at your company. It has to be a systemic structure within the company that all employees must be part of the uh, re recruiting uh, and referral strategy. We know that a lot of companies often depend on their existing employees for their referrals. And you can have a team of 200 diversity leaders doing diversity recruiting, but if that's against 200,000 employees that are doing referrals and they're not doing diversity referrals, then you're never gonna move the needle. So this has to uh, be included and there must be accountability um, for companies. And then secondly, is that it has to be intentional inclusion, meaning that uh, you have to look at the pipeline of saying, how can I be intentional to make sure that we are looking at women, Latinos, African-Americans, Asian-Americans, uh, diverse abilities, uh, LGBTQ uh, plus uh, leaders that we can 
uh, make sure that we are cultivating uh, them to rise up the corporate ladder. And then in this period where you are seeing a high number of retirements, you know, as you know, the baby boomers were in 1964, from 19, 1946 to 1964, but we know it's bell-shaped. So the peak of this bell right now is 1957 to 1961. Those who are 1957 are now 65 years of age today. So we know that in the next four years, we're gonna see a lot number of retirees. So how can we make sure that there is what I call um, uh, a, a inclusive succession so that we make sure that we are using this as a way to help uh, include more uh, people of color uh, and more diversity at these high levels and make sure that everyone is part of it and take the chief diversity officer out of HR and put them and put the chief diversity officer into a strategic role uh, reporting to the CEO and then you'll see that kind of movement happen. Thank you so much, Sid, for those insights. And let's turn it to Kathleen. You've shared some of the promising solutions you're working on. What else is really exciting you right now? Oh, you're on mute, I think. One of the things that we find um, most interesting is this opportunity to really think about what the future is gonna require. What are the competencies that we need and how do we then build um, selection procedures, assessment procedures that will help organizations identify a much broader pipeline, right? So there needs to be a broader net that's cast. And one of the ways you can do that is by leveraging technology. So instead of um, in organizations having only a few people apply to a higher level job, maybe you can cast a much broader net by creating say video-based simulation. Some of the things that we found are immersive case studies are very helpful for, for um, underrepresented groups to be able to show what they might be able to do if exposed to the challenges of the job. So to the extent that organizations have relied on things like education or previous experience, refocusing by thinking about Let's put you in this situation and see how you would handle that situation. Gives a much broader opportunity for people to show they may not have that, that particular degree, but they do have the skills that are necessary to do the job and to do the job in the way um, that it might be reimagined. So for example, a few years ago, we dealt with um, looking, at, this is a different kind of job, but looking at state trooper jobs. And there was an interest in getting state troopers who were more um, in tune with communities that they serve. And we found ways to look at the kinds of things that would help that beyond the, what you typically would look at. You would look for things like um, leadership skills. You would look for people belonging to organizations in the community. You might look for multiple languages or people who have lived in certain communities, that multicultural environment that people are in. You need to, we need, and, and as organizational psychologists, as we work with um, Fortune 100 companies, what we're saying to them is, we must define much more broadly what we're looking for and then measure that in a consistent way. And, and we find that even in organizations where it is just interviewing, there is a tremendous opportunity to structure interviews, to make sure that interviewers are using the kinds or asking the kinds of questions that are important. Um, it, Sherm recently uh, had an article that showed that most managers who interview have not received interviewer training ever, and that all they know about how to interview is when they were interviewed themselves. Well, if we can get beyond that to really looking at what does the job require and we build interviews that actually ask the questions that would help us get those answers and give managers the opportunity not to fall back on their stereotypes. There's research for years has talked about in the first 20 seconds, someone makes up their mind. No, 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 what this training that we've been working with a couple of very large corporations to develop and then um, spread more broadly has to do with uh, really uh, defining what is required and keeping the manager and the interviewer engaged so that they're evaluating the full range of information that somebody brings to the table. 
I, I think those are all uh, important, but beyond that, I, I would like to echo um, the comments of others that you need a supportive corporate environment. The corporation has to understand inclusion and the corporation has to be prepared to accept and support it. Thank you so much, Kathleen. And let's uh, turn it to Vita to share what you're seeing happening. Yes, well, you know, um, Director Young, I think that corporations need to think as proactively about their brands and diverse community um, as they do their brands in order to sell their products and services. And I think how you go about your recruiting, as Sid and Kathleen mentioned, is really important and it matters. So employers shouldn't leave it to chance, especially now, and wait for candidates to come to them. They should adopt more proactive uh, strategies. So I believe employers need to raise their visibility and their engagement level with diverse groups so that they're viewed as welcoming and interested, engaged, and inviting um, potential employers. And they need to set engagement and participation metrics and measure their progress. So as their levels of engagement and participation rise, so too will their reputation and with it, the number of good applicants that they receive. But how they might go about reimagining uh, how they conduct their outreach is to being involved in diverse communities, whether that's through urban schools, with HBCUs, other universities that have large diverse populations, um, telling their employees and professional and trade staff to be involved in minority professional societies or trade groups, reimagining perhaps how they use social media to actually offer helpful career information for diverse audiences in the areas where they know that they will be recruiting. And once they offer uh, good information to these groups through social media, they'll be able to establish and create their own social networks to which they can turn uh, to post positions and to recruit. So ultimately, I, I think it's important for uh, corporations to realize that don't just send a check, although that check is important to fund different diverse organizations, but send the check and then send your best people uh, to build relationships with diverse talent pools be consistent, you'll be noticed, and your brand will be strengthened as a result. Because I believe that organizations should view themselves and their goal as being a magnet for diverse applicants and assuring that those applicants have a good experience from start to finish when they apply. And that picks up on some of the points that Kathleen made about assuring that those who interview have good, strong interview skills. Well, thank you so much, Vita. I really appreciate you all sharing that perspective of what, what you see working in the employer realm. I'd like to turn it now to Lola, Fred, and Cindy to talk about what you think workers really want to see as part of diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. We know that hiring is tied to so many other aspects of work, whether it be job training, fair pay, or opportunities for advancement. And I'd like to turn it first to Lola to share what you think as some of the key issues um, and how hiring is connected to other aspects of workplace equity. Thank you so much for, for the question. And, and there are a number of strategies that, that, that are really exciting and promising that are helping to connect um, equitable hiring to strengthening um, whole sectors. You know, one of the things that I think is that, that, that I wanna echo that's been shared is that employers can't do it alone. And in order to really prioritize uh, equitable, uh, building an equitable workforce and ensuring, you know, anti-discrimination uh, protections in the workplace, you know, you have to build a team, right? And you have to use tools to make that happen. The, by doing that, employers are able to really um, hold the equity work at the same level of priority that they may hold, you know, completing the project on time and, and under budget, right? And, and some of the practices, right, that we've seen, particularly around some of the transit construction sector work is investing in this idea of workforce intermediaries, right? These are individuals or organizations that have credible relationships to workers and communities. They have um, partner networks that help to address 
um, the needs and understand the needs of, of, of underrepresented workers like black workers and ways to ensure success. Um, and they also, you know, have the tools, right, to bring those partners together to forecast sort of workplace needs. What kind of workers? How many workers? When do you need these workers? To set goals, right, and to identify what are those strategies for outreach, right? You might not reach Black workers in an ad in the Wall Street Journal, right? You may need to go to churches. You may need to go to community institutions, right, to share um, that information through those channels. They understand the outreach and recruitment process. And, and what does it mean to really support a worker from an outreach recruitment training and then a placement and retention um, uh, uh, sort of uh, what we call it the flow, right? The flow toward a quality job. So, so investing in those kinds of partnerships. The other thing is investing in third party monitoring and technology that can track workforce utilization. So if you're investing in building this workforce, how do you ensure that they are fully participating? Not just that they are counted on in the job or on the job site, but you know, how are, what is their percentage and share of the total hours in the project? What is their total share of wages and in real time to be able to see the impact that you are making as a business on these vulnerable and hardest hit communities and populations that you want to bring um, into your workplace. And then the last thing is building space for workers to share what they know in terms of building an equitable workforce and to also um, address any issues that may arise coming out of workplace culture, workplace dynamics, to be able to talk about it as an organization and to build the relationships um, and the narrative, right, that the issue of an equitable workforce and a safe workplace for workers um, is priority. So we see a number of these practices being implemented in some of the work that we did um, in Los Angeles. And I want to say that in one campaign that we did with the LA Metro uh, Transit Authority, you know, these, uh, the combination of these practices you know, along with a, a union project labor agreement ended up with us going from 2% black workers participating on a project to 26% black workers participating on that project. So, so they work um, when that investment is made. Thank you so much, Lola, for sharing that powerful perspective. Let me turn it to Fred. What really matters to workers as we think about workplace equity and hiring? Sure. Well, look, unions by design, we advocate for workers' rights and we hold employers accountable. I mean, we work with employers to negotiate fair wages, fair benefits, the opportunities for advancement. And many unions in the workplace have committees that work with employers on things like workplace safety and health, racial and social justice and equity and hiring practice. But too often, employers view unions as adversarial and as structures that limit employers' ability to do what they want, when they want. And too often companies bargain with workers in bad faith and that degrades the process and drive an unnecessary wedge between management and the workers. And look, it doesn't have to be that way. Some very successful European companies, especially German auto manufacturers, they see unions as collaborators, necessary structures that provide the insights and perspectives that help prevent the company from veering off course. And they have work councils where worker representatives sit at the table as executives to discuss and decide what is best for the company. And it's a very, very successful business model. And too often in America, the worker is cut out of these discussions. Labor in America is seen as a cost, something to pinch, to grow the bottom line, to return value, to the shareholders and the venture capitalists. But when workers are valued, their input is considered early and often, problems are nipped in the bud and overall health of the company improves. And we got studies that show that. And the overall health of the community also improves. Equity and opportunity, they're baked in the unions. And you know the labor movement, we have the largest workforce training program in the United States, only next to the US military. And unions help close the gender and racial and wage gap 
The hourly wage for women workers represented by a union are 4.7% higher on average than for non-unionized working uh, women workers. Black workers represented by a union is 13.1% more and Latino and Hispanic workers are paid 18.8% more. So a collective bargain agreement, I submit is the single most powerful tool to make sure all workers are included. Workplaces are diverse and accessible that there is equity in hiring practices, pay and advancement opportunities, and that workers gain the skills needed for the jobs of the day and the jobs of tomorrow. Thank you so much, Fred, for sharing those really powerful insights. I wanna let Sydney wrap us up here. Sydney, Cind wrap us up on your perspective. What is it that workers really want? Thank you, Dir Director Young. And I would say as, as a millennial, as one of the youngest lead leader leading a national legacy organization, one of the things that we look at is representation. Representation matters. And it's not enough to put out a statement during Black History Month or Hispanic Heritage Month or API Heritage Month. We need to see actions. And the way that we see actions, particularly for companies who market to the Latino community, profit from our communities, is making sure that we are represented at the highest level. What we know for sure is that so many individuals, and today, America 2022, are paying attention to the trends of corporate America. And we know that there are states like California with AB 979, which mandates that corporations headquartered in California have a minority on their board, that our community is taking action. More than that, we also want to see chief diversity officers that report directly to the CEO, as Sid Wilson pointed out, but that also are empowered with a staff and that have budgets to be able to realistically execute across a company that that may be domestic and at times global. I would also add that for so many women, and let's remember that in January of last year, 80% of the workforce that vanished were women. We want equal pay for equal work. It is 2022. It is not acceptable that in today's America, women are still massively underpaid. Latinas are only paid 53 cents to the dollar of what our Caucasian counterparts would, do, would be paid if they were doing the same exact job. And so as I look at the future of America, as I look at our younger workforce, we are paying attention. We are holding corporations accountable and we are demanding that corporations have at the highest levels in corporate board America, in their executive suite, in their C-suite levels and in decision-making positions, our community, the community that reflects the diversity of our country and our economy. Thank you so much, Cindy, and all of you. We know that to be successful in hiring, we need to make sure workplaces are inclusive and allowing people to advance and contribute. So thank you for those perspectives. We are almost out of time, but as I wrap up, I wanna do a lightning round, sort of in 20 seconds. Name one thing that we can do together to build on the legacy of Dr. King and advance equity in hiring. Um, and I will just go according to my screen, Vida. Oh, I think you're on mute. Hey, Equity, I'm with Cindy on that one. We need to address that and make people stop asking how much you make in the interview process. Thank you, Kathleen. That's the fierce urgency of now. It, now's the time, let's get it done. Lola. Recognizing that workers have amazing contributions to make to sectors, to the workplace, to communities. And when workers do well, our communities do well. So let's make workers do well, and particularly those hardest hit communities like Black workers. Thank you. Sid. Um, take serious action and be strategic about it. Don't uh, look west trying to find a sunrise and then complain that you're spending all this money trying to find a sunrise looking in the wrong direction. Look east where you can find those solutions and it starts with that sunrise and then be methodical and be a champion. Don't just support, be a champion and be an ally. Thank you so much, Sid and Cindy. Freedom, respect, and dignity for all workers across America and across the globe. Thank you. And Fred, I will give you the last word. 
Well, we all have a stake in it. Unions, government, industry. It's a three-legged stool, and it doesn't work if the legs aren't equal. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, we have so uh, learned so much from this conversation and are really energized about the work ahead. I will turn it to Chair Burroughs for some brief clothing, closing remarks. Well, thank you, uh, Director Yang, and my sincere, sincere thanks to everyone who joined us today. And special thanks, of course, to Director Yang and to Vice Chair Samuels, as well as to all of our colleagues here at EOC and at OFCCP who helped prepare for today's event. And most of all, I would like to extend my very heartfelt thanks to our distinguished guests for all of your time and your really valuable insights. Today's conversation is just the beginning of our work. And by strengthening diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in the workplace, we can help ensure that as our nation recovers from the pandemic, we build a truly inclusive economy that works for everyone. So I look forward to the work ahead and to what we can accomplish together. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Chair Burroughs. I want to thank everyone joining us today for your participation. And I want you to, I want to invite you to join us in this effort. You can sign up for messages from our agency's Gov Delivery System or check out our landing pages for hire, which we will be updating with new events and materials. We look forward to hearing from you on the work you're developing to develop innovative recruiting and hiring, initi hiring initiatives. Please share resources, research, and ideas with us at the hire email address on our landing page, which you'll see on the screen in just a moment. So thank you all again for joining us.